If you're just joining in and have missed the previous few episodes, click the link in either the description below or the card in the top right corner. Both of these will take you to a playlist containing all the videos in our Introduction to Data Structures series so far, which you can use to catch up. In this segment, we'll be talking about the stack. We'll start off with some background information surrounding the different types of data structures, which is going to be pertinent to our discussion. Then we'll do a brief overview of the stack, discuss creating and implementing it, and showing off some methods that are commonly associated with it. Following that, we'll discuss the stack's big O notation equations, and then finally talk about some common uses for the stack, both on the developer side and the consumer side. We've got a lot to cover, so let's just jump right into it. Now, right now, we're at the part of the series where we'll be diverging from what are known as random access data structures, arrays and array lists, and diving into sequential access data structures. So what's the difference? Well, if you remember back to our segments on arrays and array lists, we were able to access any element within the data structure by calling upon its index. Each element was independent of the one before or after it, and obtaining a certain element did not rely on any of the ones before or after it. That basically describes the gist of a random access data structure, one where each element can be accessed directly and in constant time. A common non-computer science example of a random access data structure would be a book. Getting the information contained on a certain page doesn't depend on all the other pages within that book, and getting an element contained within a random access data structure doesn't depend on all the other elements contained within that data structure. In contrast, elements in a sequential access data structure can only be accessed in a particular order. Each element within the data structure is dependent on the others and may only be obtainable through those other elements. Most of the time, this means accessing is not going to be instantaneous. A common non-computer science example of sequential access would be a tape measure. To get to the measurement of 72 inches, you first have to go through inches 1 through 71. There's no way to just instantly get to 72 inches without first breaking every single law of thermodynamics. These are also sometimes called limited access data structures because unlike random access data structures, we don't have the luxury of an O of one time complexity. So there you have it. Random access data structures, which allow instantaneous accessing power and independent elements, and sequential access data structures, which only allow accessing through a particular order with dependent elements. We've already talked about some common random access structures, such as the array and the array list. And now, through the next few segments, we'll be covering a few sequential access data structures, such as stacks, queues, linked lists, etc., etc. And we'll be starting with the stack. We've already skirted around the topic long enough, so let's finally talk about what a stack actually is. Now, the stack is a sequential access data structure in which we add elements and remove elements according to the LIFO principle. LIFO, which stands for last in, first out, means that whichever element we added to the stack last is going to be the first one we retrieve. Think of this as a stack of books. Each time you add another book to the top, you do so by stacking it on top of the others. If we wanted to get a book in the middle of that stack, we would first have to take off the books on top of it. We can't just grab that book from the stack and expect the entire thing not to fall in on itself. The same goes for a stack as a data structure. We add elements to the stack, and retrieve them by taking them off the top. There's only one way in and one way out for the data. We can't simply access or modify any element within the stack willy-nilly like we were able to do with the array and the array list. This may seem like a weakness, but remember what I said during the segment on time complexity. Many of these data structures have a built-in functionality which gives them an edge on the others, and the stack, with its LIFO properties, is a prime example of that. Now let's talk about how we actually create a stack. Shown on your screen now are three different ways to do so in Java, Python, and C-sharp. Now just like the array list, the stack is an external class not included in the base version of these languages, meaning you're going to have to import it before using it. This also means that sometimes when defining a stack, you must involve the stack name, as you can see we do with Java and C-sharp. After that, you can see that for the Java version, we have to include the type of stack we are creating, in this case a stack of strings, then a name for the stack is added, and in most cases we set that equal to new stack with some parentheses, and in Java's case, a respecification that it's a string stack. Now, unlike the array list, however, you'll notice that we don't include a size for the stack, and that's because the size of a stack dynamically changes depending on how many elements are contained within it at a certain time. 
All right, let's take this example stack that we've just created and now talk about some common methods that can be called upon it. Okay, so the stack class will always come with two methods, those being push and pop. These are fundamental methods which we use to interact with the stack, making them extremely important. In addition to those two, I'm also going to cover two more methods, peak and contains, which are also both very useful and can be found within the stack class associated with most programming languages. All right, let's begin with push. Now push is a method which pushes an object or element onto the top of the stack. It takes in an object to add to the stack as an argument. When we do this, that element becomes the forefront of the stack and its size is dynamically increased by one. If we pull up our example stack and start running some push commands with a variety of strings, you'll see that the data structure is slowly built. Now, channel, this, to, subscribe, a series of completely random words seamlessly pushed onto the stack. As you can see, we're only adding information from one spot, the top. There's no insert method where we can just jam a string into the middle of the stack. There is, however, a pop method. The pop method is used to remove an element from the top of the stack. It takes in no arguments and will return the element that is popped off the stack back to the user. Once a pop method has run, the element that was the forefront of the stack is removed and returned, and the element which was at the second from the top becomes the new head of the stack. So on our example stack, if we popped off each element, you'd see that each time one of those strings is taken from the stack and returned back to the user until we are left with a sad, empty stack with no free promotion. Let's add them back, obviously just for the sake of these next two methods, and now for continuing the shameless plug. Now push and pop are how we interact with the data in our stack, so they're fundamentally the backbone of our program. The next two I want to talk about are more so used to interact with the data inside the stack without actually changing it, and the first of these is the peak function. The peak method allows you to look at the top of the list without actually removing it. We talked about before that the only way to access elements within a stack was through the top. And this method is simply just a way to look at what the top contains without having to pop it off. It takes in no arguments and will just return back the contents of the top element. In this case, if we ran it on our example stack, subscribe would be returned to the user. Now if we popped off the top element and ran it again, two would be returned instead. You get the idea. Again, let's push subscribe back onto the top for educational purposes. Now the final method I'll be talking about is the contains method. This one is used for searching through a stack. It takes in an object as an argument and will return a boolean of whether or not that item is contained within the stack. Essentially, this is a way we can search through the stack without popping off every element until we find the one we're looking for, as the contains method does not modify the stack in any way. So example.contains with an argument of subscribe would return true, an argument of this would also return true, but an argument of hello, for example, would return false. So there they are, four common stack functions which are going to be vital if you ever want to build a stack-based program. Now let's talk about time complexity. For accessing, the stack has a time complexity equation of O of n. This is because in order for us to reach a certain element within the stack, we first have to pop off every element before it. Think of it like this, if we had a stack of stones and needed to get to the bottom one, we'd first have to take off every stone on top of it. So worst case scenario, if the element we want is at the bottom of the stack, we need to pop off every element above it before we can get to it, making the time complexity equation O of n. Searching is going to be O of n for the exact same reason. Worst case scenario, if we're searching for an element that's at the bottom of the stack, we have to go through the whole thing just to find it. This is one of the major drawbacks to using stacks. With arrays and ArrayList, we could access any element within the data structure instantaneously, and with the stack that's just not possible because of the way it's structured. Now inserting and deleting both make up for this by having time complexity equations of O of 1. This essentially boils down to the fact that using our push and pop methods really only requires one operation. Since the data flows in and out of a single point, inserting or removing an element from that point can be done immediately. Push, we just add it to the top, and pop, we just take it off the top. It's not rocket science. Actually, it's computer science, but that's beside the point. There's no need to rearrange data or move elements around like there was for the array and array list because we physically can. So there you go, the time complexity equations for the stack. 
Now you might be wondering if there are even uses for a first-in, first-out data structure, because it seems kind of out there. I mean, limiting yourself to a single entry point? But you'd actually be mistaken. Stacks are used everywhere, both in the actual writing of code and real-world applications. One of the fundamental processes of programming, recursion, uses stacks as a way of keeping track of active functions or subroutines. Now I won't get into recursion too much here, but it basically it's the process of functions repeatedly calling themselves. When a function calls itself, that call is added to a stack of processes, and when the stack reaches what's known as a base case, the functions are then all popped off. It goes much, much deeper than that, but we don't have time for a full-blown lesson on recursion. If you want that, you can click the card in the top right corner of your screen, or the link in the description below, which will take you to that part in our Introduction to Programming series where we cover it. Either way, stacks can be incredibly useful, and not just the programmers. Some other examples of stack-based functions that you use every day include the undo-redo button in word processors and the backpaging on web engines. Both of these continually add tasks you've completed to a stack, either a web page you visited or a word you typed. And then, when you press undo, or go back a page in Chrome, they pop off whatever the last task was off the stack, and bam, you're right back to where you were a second ago. It's like magic, but better. As you can see, while it may not look like much of a fighter, the stack has a lot of real-world applications on both the consumer side and the client side. You interact and use stacks every day without even realizing it, and so by learning them, you're opening up a whole world of opportunities. That concludes our discussion on the stack, a sequential access data structure in which we use the LIFO principle to add and remove elements from. Up next, we'll be taking a complete 180 and talking about an equally useful data structure that functions very, very differently than the stack, the queue. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. These videos can sometimes take quite a while to research, script out, and create visuals for, not to mention the audio recording and editing process. In total, these episodes can take up to 12 hours start to finish, so we appreciate you sticking around to the end. If you like this type of content and want it delivered to your subscription box free of charge, click the link on the right of your screen now to subscribe to the channel. As an added bonus, if you click the bell next to the subscribe button, we'll tell the big ups at YouTube to notify you when a new video is uploaded for no additional fee. And if you can't wait that long and are craving more of my melodic voice, you can click the playlist on the left of your screen now, which will take you to a playlist containing more programming fun. Until next time, peace.